Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. This story took place in the fall of 1995. I can't say it was necessarily a Sasquatch encounter, as that wasn't something I was really aware of back then. It was only over the last two to three years or so of listening to stories and encounters with the creatures that I started to think back to that time and wonder if that could have been what was in the woods that day with me. I was in my second year of university in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and was living with my aunt and uncle to save money that would otherwise have been necessary for residence. My aunt was also my mom's twin sister, so it was kind of like being home as well. And my uncle was blind, but an incredible, independent, and smart man who was very loving and kind. Those years were some of my happiest and I met my best friend while at school there, too. But I digress. The story I'm about to tell you occurred shortly after I returned from summer vacation. My aunt and uncle owned a cottage about 68 kilometers north of Sault Ste. Marie on Lake Superior. It was nearly at the end of a dirt road off the main highway, and there were others that owned properties on either side of them, but many didn't have buildings on their property or if they did, they were only used in the summer months. So, all in all, it was very secluded and quiet as most people packed up their sites in the fall and didn't return until the following spring. It was so remote, there were no phone lines at the time, and as I mentioned, the road was gravel and twisted for several kilometers through the woods, adjacent to the shores of Lake Superior. The neighbor on one side of them was an older couple who lived full-time out there and had a huge black Labrador dog the size of a small bear. Her name was Misty, and she was a gentle giant, very loving and tame. She used to come over all the time to visit and hang out during the day when we were out there. Generally, this was on weekends as I had classes during the week and my aunt taught at the nearby public school. So, come Friday evening, we would pack up the van and head out of town for some peace and quiet on the lake. I loved the weekends for that. I was a city girl, born and raised in Mississauga, a city of about half a million people located just outside of Toronto. So, for me, being this far out in the middle of the woods on a quiet stretch of lake was heaven. It gave me a lot of time to think and just take in nature and relieve the stress of studies and missing my family. One lazy sunny Saturday afternoon, my aunt and uncle were puttering around the garden and Mitzi had stopped by to visit, so I decided to take her for a walk with me up the road a bit. I waved goodbye and her and I headed up the driveway to the road. I really didn't have a destination in mind other than to walk. So we headed in the direction of the highway as going in the other direction just took you to the end of the road and there wasn't that far to go. As we came closer to the first corner in the road, I noticed a path cut through the trees to my right. I hadn't ever noticed it before and it looked kind of like a driveway so I thought I'd head up that path and check out what was down there Nobody owned the property on the one side of the road as it was just wilderness. Everyone built on the lakeside so they could have waterfront property, so the fact that there was a very crude road of sorts intrigued me. Thinking back on those days now, I can tell you I feel a chill running down my spine at the thought of what I could have run into back then. I have always believed in the supernatural and cryptids to a certain degree, I guess my feeling is that you have to have an open mind. We would be crazy to think that, in a universe this big, we are the only living species. Anyway, as I walked down the lane, Mitzi sauntered along beside me, sniffing out bushes and plants 
along the way, as dogs do. It wasn't a long road, but after about two minutes, we emerged into a large open space, and there was even a bulldozer parked at the edge of a deep pit. It must have been a quarry or something, as it was quite a large open space with the woods encircling it. I wandered around the edge of the pit, looking down into it, and there was really nothing but large boulders and other rocks. So, after a few minutes of that, I decided to climb on the bulldozer and sit down for a bit. The sun had been shining bright, and the birds chirping, and all in all, it was a very peaceful and beautiful day. I watched Mitzi roaming around the perimeter of the area, and then after a few minutes, everything went silent. Something deep down inside me shot a wave of sudden fear through me. What was at once a moment of peace and serenity suddenly seemed eerie and foreboding. Something didn't feel right. I looked over and saw Mitzi standing, still as a statue, staring into the woods about fifty feet from me. I listened for the sounds of the forest, but there was nothing. I started feeling scared, but wasn't sure why. Was there a bear nearby? It couldn't be. Normally, they would be heard and Mitzi would have barked. She stood there, not moving, and then, all of a sudden, she just shot past me in a dead run, heading for the road we had come from. This was not right. She never left me alone on a walk before, and certainly I never saw her do that. I called to her, and she just looked back at me and kept on running. I suddenly got the feeling I was being watched. I can't explain it. I wanted to run after Mitzi, but I was frozen in place. I looked towards the woods where she had been staring, and a few seconds later, I heard some tree snap. That was enough for me. I jumped off the bulldozer and ran for dear life for the road. I didn't look back. The hairs on the back of my neck were standing up, and I just had the feeling if I looked, I would see something I didn't want to. When I got to the main road, I turned to my left and saw Mitzi standing at the end of the cottage driveway looking back at me. When she saw me coming, she turned and headed down the driveway, disappearing into the trees. I ran the rest of the way back, hearing the odd branches cracking to my left in the tree line. When I got back to the cottage, I told my aunt and uncle I was just heading inside for a drink and would start lunch. I didn't want to be outside anymore. Relief swept over me when I made it inside. I didn't say anything to them about thinking I might have been followed because I didn't want them to think I was a crazy person. That night, I said goodnight to my aunt and uncle, and they retired to the one bedroom in the cabin. I slept out in the main room on a futon next to the fireplace. I had never been afraid sleeping out there on my own, but that night it was all I could do to settle my nerves after the incident on our walk. It sounds foolish, I know, to be afraid of something that you can't even see, but no matter how I explain it, I just can't clearly state how I felt that day. It had gone from serene to extreme fear and panic in a matter of seconds, something that I'd never felt before save for maybe watching a scary movie and jumping at the surprise attack scene. The cabin was a one bedroom with a bathroom, and the main area was open with a living room, dining area, and kitchen. There were windows on two sides, and on the back of the cabin, there were windows with a back door in the middle. In the daylight, it was very bright and cozy, and allowed a great view of the woods surrounding the property and the lake below. At night, though, it felt like a fishbowl, and I didn't dare turn on any light as whatever was outside would be able to see in, and see me. Not that they couldn't anyways. I'm sure wild animals have much better night vision than a human, but it made me feel better to be in the dark nonetheless. It could have been my overactive imagination that night, or just lingering fear from the afternoon's adventure, but as I laid there in the dark, listening, I thought I could hear something faintly outside. I carefully pulled the covers down far enough to see out the window, but keeping most of my lower face and body covered and attempted to peer outside. But 
It was such pitch black outside, I couldn't see. I was about to sit up and creep closer to the window to peek out further, but then a thought that something might actually peer in at me stopped me in my tracks, and I laid back down, quivering in my bed until I fell asleep. After that day, I never ventured out again alone for a walk. In fact, I kept near to the cabin and only went walking with friends or my aunt and uncle and the dog. What had been my peaceful refuge had become a sudden concern for safety. I'd always been concerned about bears and wolves, but now my fear had gotten the better of me, and I was suddenly afraid that maybe, aside from those predators, something else was lurking in the woods. Years later, I traveled to Sault Ste. Marie with my husband, and we took a road trip from Toronto up north to visit my aunt and uncle again, who were this time living in a condo, and they were too old to maintain their home. They graciously offered us the cottage to stay in for privacy and a relaxing getaway. They planned to come out one night for the afternoon and have dinner with us. We in turn had planned a few excursions into the city so I could show my husband the area where I'd gone to school. My husband loved it. He had always enjoyed the countryside and the great outdoors, so he was in his glory, playing with the neighbor's new German shepherd and chopping wood. As he was busying himself with chores outside, I kept mostly indoors, but ventured out on the back deck and down to the lake. My uncle, years ago, had built a wooden deck pathway all winding down the hillside to the rocky lakeshore out behind the cottage. There were various decks as well for sitting and barbecuing. However, I couldn't shake the creepy feeling of not being alone. I kept the dog with me, and whenever she or my husband were out of sight, I would immediately head closer to the cottage. We had a blast, but I never told him about my fears, which were always there whenever I visited that place. After that one incident so many years ago, Things were never quite as peaceful as they had been before that day with Mitzi. Call me crazy, but for whatever reason, the woods no longer became the serene place they had been for me. Maybe it had nothing to do with Sasquatch at all, but rather the insecurities of a young adult alone in the woods. Whatever the case, the stories I've heard on your channel and others over the past few years always leave me wondering in the back of my mind if it was a Sasquatch that day. I guess I'll never really know. On to the next one. Returning to my birthplace was not all full of pleasant and treasured memories, but rather a trip back to visit the one place where I could always relax, knowing that I was going among the only friends I had ever trusted. No, surprisingly, they were not humans at all. They were Sasquatch. The only way I was able to make it all the way through 12 years of schooling is because I had a relief where I could retreat when things got rough. I had few friends as a kid because my father was an in-your-face type of person who would give any potential friends such grueling questions and answer sessions that they would never come back again. So I stayed pretty much to myself. Fortunately for me, my father worked long hours and got drunk within a short time of arriving home. He wasn't abusive, but my mother became a lot like him in the fact that he pretty much talked and she listened. As long as I did my chores, everything was fine. We lived out in the country on a 30-acre property that had once been a farm. As there was an old barn and several outbuildings, and although most unused, part of my duties were to keep doors and windows closed, and my summertime projects generally involved laborious and boring hours of scraping and painting. I do not remember my parents, either one, ever walking through the property out behind the farm, but that's where my best friends lived. I had joined the army the day after I graduated from high school, and other than the two quick trips home, I had been away for eight years. Not much had changed, except father was a little more stooped than I remembered, and my mother was pretty much as docile as before. 
They had no friends other than a few relatives whom they seldom ever saw, which I could understand. They had changed very little. I was welcomed warmly, but more as a friend than a son. There again, this was only my personal conjecture, but there was no affection seemingly shown more than the family dog, which was a painful loss for me when I found out that my boyhood pal Jinx had passed away. I visited her grave directly upon arrival. As soon as I had settled and unpacked, I made a visit the very next morning to see my closest childhood friends, telling my mother I wanted to see the old place where I had made my fort as a kid. I had walked the one-time pasture that I was so familiar with, and it had changed little from my younger days, with the exception that the trees and brush seemed huge. I must have walked among the network of trails for over a mile before I came on a monstrously thick grove of balsam trees that, at first sight, looked like a Christmas tree farm, and I wound my way deep among the trees until I must have been over 200 feet from the edge of the grove. There, I came to a most familiar scene. There before me was the old pine log that lay directly across the small clearing. Few, if any, weeds or even small trees were growing in this secret place, and I remembered when I had often pulled up any new weeds or trees that tried to take root in our meeting and camping spot. When I say our, I meant me and my old friends. I sat down on the familiar place on the log and rubbed my fingers over the flattened top that had held my initials and since I had never been able to whistle, I drew out my key ring along with the ancient brass boatswain's whistle, and the familiar chirp sounded through the forest, as it had so often in my youth. I knew that it was highly unlikely that there was even a chance that I would get any response to my signal, but reliving the only pleasant memories of my childhood made me keep blowing that boatswain's whistle again and again. A tear dripped from my eye as I watched it crawl slowly down the yellowish weed. I suddenly became aware of a large shadow over me. Raising my eyes, standing over me was my childhood friend. I stood up and his huge arm lifted me completely off the ground. There we were, my six-foot frame engulfed totally by a creature that was almost double my size. His long hair was even longer than I remembered but I couldn't believe my good fortune after being away so long. No human being could have looked so good to anyone than my friend Champ. And it seems funny when I look back on that moment. Here we were, two different species, a human and a Sasquatch, hugging and crying together like long-lost brothers. Believe me when I say Champ is my brother. And I'm sure in his way he feels the same. I don't know how long we spent just looking at each other and rubbing each other's arms before I reached for my knapsack and withdrew an assortment of fruit that I had bought from the market down the country road, and Champ's eyes widened at the selection of apples, bananas, and carrots that I remembered were his favorite. He took his time favoring the assortment as we watched each other. Just like I remembered, Champ sat leaning against the huge tree and enjoying every bite, as I pictured him doing if I ever saw him again, and at that moment, I was happier than I had ever been. I hoped Champ would understand, as I tried to refer to his other relatives, but I placed the flat of my hand at different heights to indicate others of his family, and I know he understood, as with each gesture, he shook his head as if to say they were no more, until I made the gesture of a person limping and he immediately pointed to the nearby tree and gestured for me to follow. And as we rounded a grove of willow trees, Champ pointed to a mound in the area in the center which was covered with a neatly placed row of similar-sized logs and several rocks holding them in place. Champ bowed to the spot, and I said, Limpy, aloud, to which he nodded. I walked over and placed my hand on the pile of logs and nodded to Champ that I understood. Then Champ indicated for me to follow, and we followed a winding trail through a part of this forest that I had never seen before, and we came to a large hill 
totally surrounded by growth of elegant pine trees. Champ gave a sort of yelp that ended in a whistle-like chirp, and I saw movement on a distant ridge. There before me, I saw a smaller Sasquatch that I could only assume was his mate. Looking back at me so out of habit, I raised my hand in a sort of hello, and the other Sasquatch partially waved in return. And then I smiled and nodded to Champ and received a huge Sasquatch hug in return. Then he headed off toward the distant ridge, which was now again deserted, with his grocery bag in hand, went off to hopefully share my gifts with his very attractive mate. I wanted to see if you would be interested in using my story in one of your videos, because I have since my visit to Champ made a decision to remain in this area, and even through my relationship with my parents has been cooler than I would have liked, I have made them an offer to purchase their property and they accepted. I will build a separate driveway and build my home on the back ridge where the forest begins. I have secured a very good job and I plan to spend my future years protecting both my parents and my close friends and his family. Wait until Champ finds out that he now has a new uncle to watch out for him. On to the next one. Back in 1983, I was fly fishing in Idaho near a popular little bend when I was confronted with a playful Bigfoot, a young, playful Bigfoot at that. I know that these things are wild animals, and that I could have been in a serious situation that day, and for a second, well, I think I was, but here is the weirdest encounter you might have ever heard of, and kind of funny too. Here is what happened to me while fly fishing in one of my favorite spots on Kelly Creek. I love my fly fishing, even before I retired. I've loved the sport and art since the late 1960s, when my dad and grandfather took me out and taught me how in the rivers, streams, and lakes of North Idaho, even after my encounter with something absolutely scary looking, but funny in the woods that day, I still head out every week I can to fish. On this particular day, however, I was out on my day off fishing. It was early spring, still a little cold outside, but it would warm to about 70 degrees that day, the first of a warm week to come, I remember. This meant bugs, tons of beautiful bugs that fish would be feeding on, and a chance for me to try a few new flies I tied myself something that became a new passion for me within the sport itself. Anyway, I had the day off and I decided I would take advantage of it and get some tests done with the new flies I had made myself. There is a beautiful little spot along Kelly Creek, a bend in fact that had in the middle when the water was not rushing over it, a small little island or bar. There is where I like to fish most of the time. See, on the other side was a steep edge where rocks sat in the water. Well, small boulders, really, and overgrown bush and trees grew along the embankment right up to the edge of the creek, creating a deep and dark pool. Casting in that general area with a dry or wet fly usually resulted in some pretty awesome catches. The trout there could be rather large sometimes, even for moving water. That was the hopes for that day, to catch a large, beautiful trout, but I got something much larger instead, and absolutely amazing to tell you the truth. I got to my destination, grabbed my gear, and suited up, if you will. I can see my car from the spot, actually. It's not like it is a long hike into some remote mountain stream in the middle of the Shire. Actually, this spot is popular for fly fishing locals. And I was surprised a bit actually that I remembered that I was the first and only person out there that beautiful spring morning. The creek was also wide in that particular area, almost as wide as a small river, but it was still considered a creek for obvious reasons. Anyway, there I was at what most people called Devil's Bend. Well, near it at least. And, on a side note, ever wonder why they name places like this Devil's Bend, Skookum Meadows, 
Well, trust me, it's because of these little, big actually, devils exist. And I'm talking about Bigfoot. It was a beautiful day. Just some low but fast-paced clouds above would come and go, blocking the sun for a moment or two. But it was already in the low 60s when I got started early that morning fishing. I put on my vest, my hat, and my line was set up before I got there, so all I had to do was rig a fly I would use that morning. It was spring, and bugs were hatching and flying everywhere, like I said. So dry fly fishing it was. Fishing was good, real good. Within just a few casts, I had a trout take it, and after a little bit of a fight, I netted a decent 13-incher. Of course, I threw it back, I was not ready to keep any at that point. I would save that for later. However, later would not happen minutes later. I have heard the stories and even a part of me believed, up to that point, the possibility of the existence of Bigfoot. Personally, for me, it was the Patterson-Gimlin film that had me somewhat believing it. It was far too real looking, and that is what many experts have said as well. I remember it started with the movement in the tree line, about 20 or so feet on the other side of the embankment, almost directly across from me. I had just cast, or quartered upstream a bit, they call it, and as I did, I noticed movement like I said. I looked back real quick and saw nothing, but I swore at that moment I had seen movement, and something big enough to really catch my attention at that. But as I peered through the tree line, nothing, no movement, no nothing. The birds still chirped, and even the cicada were making their buzzing sound. I was not feeling at all uncomfortable, at least not yet. I decided I was tired of mending and was going to cast again upstream, and there it was again, the moment out of the corner of my eye. However, this time, I caught it long enough to get a location or general area from which it came. It took me a second, and I pulled my hat a little lower over my eyes to see through the dark line of trees, and that is when I took a double take as what seemed to be about a five-foot-tall person leaned out from behind of a tree all of a sudden. The one thing I noticed quickly, though, was how broad this person was. Plus, even in this particular set of wood and time of day, I should have seen more than just one shade of color in the silhouette. You know, like the color of a shirt, pants, or whatever they might be wearing. It moved behind the tree again, and then back out, but this time it waved at me. What I thought was waving, however, it was basically a mimicking of me with my fly fishing cast, I would come to realize. Then, it did it a second time. This time, I made a cast without taking my eyes off this person, and there they were again, making the same movement with their arm. I suddenly realized as it made the motion that this was not a person. It was something else. Nobody I knew had arms that long. At least nobody around five feet tall, that is. And the fact that it was now further out from the trees, you could tell they had no clothes on. It was fur or hair that completely covered this thing. It finally stood out from behind the tree, and that is when I realized I was staring at a Bigfoot, and it must have been a young one. Looking back, it was a young one, as I would hear what might have been its parents minutes later. Besides, it looked young, not that I had a reference point to base that conclusion upon, but to me, it seemed to be young. It had to be. It was slightly hunched over, and there was little if no neck at all, it seemed. Even though it would never come out of the protection of the trees and into the light of morning, I could see it plain as day. It was at least five feet tall, give or take a few inches, like I said. Its face was dark, and I could not really see the eyes. However, the brow line seemed large, as if it protruded out over the face a bit, casting a dark shadow over them. Its arms were long, and the hair it was covered in was rather thick, it seemed, but short, and almost light brown in color, maybe even a bit orangish. 
to be, matter of fact, where the sun did trickle through the canopy of trees, this thing, its hair, well, it seemed to glisten almost. Or maybe it just had a shiny sheen to it. It kept one hand on the tree, though, and never once did it take its eyes off me. I felt creeped out, but at the same time, for some reason, I felt like I was okay, like I was not going to be harmed. I don't know why I felt that, but still, I made no fast movements. Everything I did was almost methodical for the next what felt like at least four to five minutes. I decided to see what else it would do, so I reeled in and decided to walk about 20 feet downstream. It followed me. I could see as it walked that its knees seemed bent at all times, and the way in which it took steps was weird, like it was purposefully walking in a straight line, and well, gliding along instead of walking. Either way, it followed me through the tree line. I stopped, made a cast, and again, it took one arm and made the casting motion I had. It was getting hotter outside, and real quick, I wiped my face with my right hand, and guess what? Yup, this thing ran its right hand over its face too. All of a sudden, I found myself rather fascinated and intrigued with this young Bigfoot, even though it started making other movements, howbeit slowly. I still had a certain amount of nervousness about me at the time, so no sudden or fast movements were made. I leaned slowly to the left and then to the right, and so did it. I know I should have been feeling rather frightened at this point, and I was, but I found myself almost smiling a teeny bit all of a sudden as well. Today, these things, these animals, can be and are in fact dangerous, something I would experience the same day. But at that point, and for the majority of my own experience that day, I think there is a side to these things that is, well, playful. Not that I would ever test that theory, however. This encounter and visual lasted all of about four to five minutes, give or take a minute. As I moved down the creek further, it followed me, but always sticking just inside the tree line a bit, and not really caring if I saw it after a minute or two. I cast again, and it continued to mimic. I caught myself studying this thing after a moment or two as well. It was all so crazy. There I was, staring at an animal that some believe is a myth, some believe went extinct, and others think is an alien of some kind. Personally, I was staring at something that was real, physical, and yes, rather scary in the face to look at. It is not like this thing smiled at me during the experience. I hate to say it, but the face was scary and ugly in a way. Part of me kept looking at the rest of its body and not at its face. Besides, I was afraid to look directly at it for some reason. But when some people say that its face seems to be droopy looking, well, they are right. It is. Like I said, this was a rather long experience and sighting. I swear it lasted almost five minutes, give or take, but I could be wrong. I never looked at my watch to know. It all ended, though, when I heard from the west of us the sound of a crisp and clear whistle. I looked back at the Bigfoot and noticed it too was looking in the same direction, and the next thing I knew, it leaned forward and whistled back twice. Its lips were huge. All of a sudden, I heard something walking towards us. It was heavy, whatever it was. Next thing I heard was a grunt, and the walking stopped. The Bigfoot I was looking at was now walking off in its weird fashion, back into the trees, and, seconds later, I heard a series of three whoops, and it was gone. Apparently, its family was nearby, I suppose, and called it home. I know it all sounds crazy, and trust me, I felt like getting my head examined after that. Even my wife and kids today think I am insane when I tell them again and again the story of my encounter with Bigfoot. But that is it. That is what happened that day, it was scary, awesome, and a powerful moment in my life, and not knowing how much danger I could have been in still haunts me today. If, however, I was in danger in the first place, listening to many encounters, I probably was in some danger with an adult out there, and maybe 
just maybe. That little Bigfoot whistled twice to say it was coming and to keep Daddy away from me, but who knows? On to the next one. My name is Matt, and I'd like to tell you about something that happened probably 30 or more years ago. It still pretty much creeps me out, and to be honest, I really don't like talking about it. But here goes. I was born and raised in eastern Montana, and since I'm kind of an old guy now, I can remember how things were before there were many people around, though Montana is still pretty uninhabited compared to most states. Where this happened is actually still pretty wild, and I think it's because it's fairly remote and there aren't many roads. At the time, I was living in the little town of Darby, which now served as a center for outdoor recreation, mostly fishing. I don't recall the population back then, but it was probably fewer than a hundred. The town sit in a beautiful valley by the Bitterroot River near some big mountains like Trapper's Peak. It used to bother me living there as I was used to seeing big vistas, not the sides of nearby mountains as I grew up in the open country of wheat fields. I used to get a bit claustrophobic there but not nearly as much after this happened. You could literally walk a few hundred yards out of town and be in wilderness at that time. There are a lot more houses there now, but it's still pretty much surrounded by the wild, and I mean for a hundred miles or more in pretty much every direction, and most of it forested with some deep canyon. There's plenty of room out there for creatures that we don't normally think much about, Actually, creatures I prefer to never think about. I've heard a number of stories where the people involved ended up moving away or decided to never go into the backcountry again. And after this happened, I can say I understand why. I did end up going into the mountains a few times after this, but I would never go alone or unarmed. Okay, back to the story. My cousin had a towing business in Hamilton, some distance up the road from Darby, and I worked for him for a few years. My wife eventually got sick and tired of the Montana winters, so we ended up moving out to California, where she had family. I sure didn't miss that backcountry after we left, but California back then was pretty nice, not crowded. We live in New Mexico now. I guess what happened kind of took my enjoyment of nature away because I used to like going out into the woods and fishing. Now that I'm retired, I'm trying to rekindle some of that enjoyment. Well, it was winter, and we just got a ton of snow, which is always good for the towing business. A lot of times, the snow would come through and the road would get bad, but it usually melted off pretty fast. Well, this time, it stayed cold, and the roads were solid ice. Like I said, lots of work for the towing business. It was late afternoon, and I'd already rescued a couple of vehicles when my cousin called and sent me up a road not too far out of town that went a few miles up into the wilderness. It followed a creek as far as it could until the canyon got too tight, and then it dead-ended in a small turnaround. Not far from the end of the road were some pretty impressive cliffs in retrospect, once you get up out of the valley, it always had kind of foreboding feeling to me. The road was narrow and gradually climbed up the side of the valley until there was a pretty good embankment going down into the creek. I think at one time the road went to an old mine, but it now serves as an access road for the few small ranches in the valley. I'd been told the vehicle was at the turnaround and the owner couldn't get it started. I didn't ask what this person was doing up there in the first place. All I can say is, as a tow truck driver, I'd seen it all. People going places they had no business going, in unbelievable conditions with inadequate vehicles and bald tires and half-dead batteries totally unprepared. It took a while to get up there, as the road gradually climbed just enough 
to make it tricky when I stop. I wanted to stop and put on chains, but there was no place to pull over, and I was afraid if we stopped, I'd start skidding backward or sideways and end up stuck, or worse yet, off the side. It was like trying to steer a toboggan. I finally made it up to the turnaround, where, sure enough, there sat a little white Honda. A guy who looked to be in his fifties was standing next to it, looking sheepish and glad to see me, as it was bone-chilling cold. He appeared to be dressed warm enough, but he had two dogs with him, a couple of short-haired hounds, and he asked if I would put them in my truck where it was warm. They were both shivering, and I felt a bit of irritation that this guy would endanger his dogs by taking them up there in the first place. But I said nothing and just put them in the truck cab, which was nice and warm. The car was fairly close to the edge of the road, and he said he was worried about getting stuck, wanting me to follow him out after we got the car started. I knew if he did go off even a little, I would never be able to pull him back on the road without chains. So I took some time, put my chains on, which was kind of a pain as it was so cold. I later asked my wife how cold it had been down in town, and she said the thermometer had read 15 degrees, and I know it was way colder up there as the wind was blowing. My wife was kind of a weather geek when we lived in Montana, as she loved torturing me about how cold it was there and how nice it was in California. Once we moved back there, she never looked at another thermometer as far as I know. Chains on, I managed to turn around in the tight spot where I could get in front and give him a jump. We didn't have those portable starter jumpers they have now, but for some reason, the car wouldn't start. And I was then beginning to think it wasn't the battery, even though nothing would turn on no light or anything. I was beginning to think something else was wrong. It was now early evening, and the cold was intensifying enough that I was starting to get chilled, even though I was dressed warm. The wind had finally died down, and I could see frost crystals in the air. I knew it was going to be a bitterly cold night. Finally, I radioed my cousin for ideas, but he was a good 30 miles away working on another rescue and couldn't help. I was thinking maybe I'd just tow the guy to a shop where they could check it out. Though it was so slick and icy, I wasn't real keen on pulling him down that hill. It was one of the few times in my towing career that I finally had to admit defeat. I told the customer that we had no choice but to go back down and come back tomorrow. He could get a motel and I'd pick him up in the morning, and we'd go try again and tow him out if need be. He looked upset and refused to go with me. I was shocked, as it seemed suicidal to me to stay out there in the cold, even if he could deal with it. I was doubtful his dogs could. His car had Minnesota plates, so I figured he at least knew something about the cold. But you just can't stay warm in a car without the engine and heater running. He then informed me that he had a warm sleeping peg and a small propane space heater for his car and would be fine, and tomorrow he'd call again if he still needed help. After some hesitation, he asked if I'd mind taking his dogs for the night, as he didn't want anything to happen to them. I told him that was fine, though I somehow suspected there was something else going on. What was he doing out here in the first place? It just seemed like there was more to his story than he was wanting to say. So I drove off into the dark, glad for the chains, as going downhill was even more treacherous. His dogs were there in the cab with me, and as I drove off, I told him I'd come back tomorrow and bring the dogs back. He seemed really appreciative, but wouldn't budge on coming with me. Back home, I called my cousin Ed, who decided to call the local sheriff, Jim, a good friend of his, and tell him about the situation. I was happy to hear this, for I knew Jim would go up there with a backup deputy or two and hopefully persuade the guy to come out for the night. Maggie, my wife, took the dogs in and fed them. Then we made them a nice bed in the living room by the fireplace 
where they settled down for the night, looking very appreciative. At that time, we still had Boggs, our old Cocker Spaniel, and I think he was pretty pleased, thinking he was having a sleepover, as he ended up sleeping out there with them instead of on top of my feet like he usually did, which was fine by me. Boggs died a few years later, at the ripe old age of 15, and I still miss him. So, anyways... Ed called me a few hours later to inform me that Sheriff Jim and his crew had gone up there. But there was no sign of a car stuck at the turnaround. Funny thing was, it had snowed a little since I'd left, and there was no sign of any tracks coming out either. But what they did find was a bit chilling and left me with a strange feeling. They said when they got there and were looking around, they were somewhat surprised to find several sets of huge footprints going on up toward the cliffs in the deep snow. They at first thought it might belong to this guy with the stuck car, but it didn't take long to realize the stride was way too long and the tracks too deep. Plus, why so many? It pretty much creeped them out, and after being pretty sure there was no car anywhere around, they left. Now, let me add a little backstory here. The autumn before all this happened, several hunters had gone missing up there, and they'd eventually been found, but the story they told when they came out was pretty incredible. I don't remember all the details, but I do recall they'd been accosted by a strange creature that was big and black, probably what we now call a Bigfoot, though back then sightings were more rare. I personally think Bigfoot have always been around, but there just weren't as many people, so they weren't seen very often. I can't recall for sure, but I think they called it a big hairy monster, which I found kind of funny, like something a kid would make up. I'd been told that the natives that once lived in that area also had legends about seeing Bigfoot, but I always laughed and wrote it off to overactive imagination. After all, I'd spent my childhood wandering around the countryside, though admittedly not the mountains. The whole idea was nonsense to me. So, when Ed told me all of this, I did pause a little. But, after talking to Maggie, we decided the customer had walked around leaving footprints, then somehow got his car started and driven out before the new snow, and therefore didn't leave any car tracks. Usually, when the snow melts, tracks will get larger, so I figured that was what was going on, though I knew it had been getting colder, not warmer. But sometimes the mind grabs onto whatever it can when confronted with strange things. But if Sheriff Jim and his guys had said the tracks were too deep and rangy for a human, who was I to question their assessment? These guys were sensible and pragmatic and not at all prone to drama but I had a heck of a time sleeping that night. The fellow had my number, so if he'd come out, why hadn't he arranged to get his dog? Maybe it was late, and he knew they'd be fine with me, and he'd call in the morning. Surely, the guy had somehow gotten his car started, but was there some connection with the tracks? Was he still somehow up there? My mind just wouldn't stop racing. Finally, around 6 a.m., I got up and made a pot of coffee, I let the dogs out in the yard while it was brewing and then fed them all an early breakfast and sat in the living room, not wanting to wake Maggie. Boggs and one of the hounds got into playing tug of war on a pool toy and I had to shut that down as they were too noisy. The hound seemed pretty happy, but maybe they always acted like that. It was starting to get daylight and I could see that the storm had passed and it would be a nice sunny day. Part of me wanted to get out and drive back up to where the car had been stuck, but the other part wanted to stay where it was warm and safe. Safe? Was I actually a little afraid of a mythological creature? I laughed at myself, then finally made some breakfast, just as Maggie was stirring. Maggie and I have always been close, and as we sat there at the kitchen table, I told her everything I was feeling. She didn't bat an eye saying it was all superstition, but she also told me she didn't want me going back up there alone. In fact, if the sheriff hadn't found anything, 
why should I even feel obliged to go back? She assured me that the fellow was probably out and would eventually call about the dog. I tried to relax, but I just couldn't forget about this guy. You might say I was worried about getting stuck with his hound, but that wasn't it at all. In retrospect, some sixth sense was telling me that if it were me, I would want someone to come back and figure out what was going on. Of course, if it were me, I wouldn't have gone out there in the first place. I guess I wasn't the only one thinking about this, as Ed called, saying he and Jim were going back up there, and they wanted me to come along and show them exactly where the car had been. I was soon following them in my tow truck, chains still on, though things were starting to warm up. It was still slick, though, and we had to take our time getting up there. Once there, I walked over and looked at the strange tracks while the others were looking for any clues as to where the car had gone. The tracks had gone to the base of the cliff, then just disappeared, as if scaling them, and I could clearly see that my hypothesis about the melting snow making them larger was wrong, as nothing had melted. So much for trying to rationalize things. The tracks were huge, and it was obvious that whatever had made them had two feet, not four like a bear. I know Sheriff Jim took photos, and I'd wish I'd done the same. Well, we all walked around and tried to figure out where the car had gone, and once I looked over the ledge, it was pretty obvious. There it sat, at the bottom of the embankment, and it looked pretty smashed up. We stood around for a minute, trying to figure out what had happened. You might say it was obvious. The guy had somehow got his car started and then slid over the edge, but it wasn't that simple. You could see where the car had been, as there were tracks all over the place from everyone the night before, but there were no tire tracks going off the edge. This was why the guys hadn't seen it the night before. There was virtually nothing obvious to indicate it had gone over the side. Instead of tire tracks, there was a place where it appeared something had been pushed over the side, which wasn't as visible the night before in the dark, but was now more apparent. Being a little better dressed than Ed and Jim, I volunteered to go over the side and check things out. Dragging the tow cable alongside me, I was wearing my heavy snowmobile suit and boots having gotten cold the previous night. The embankment wasn't so steep that I couldn't slide down it, though the snow was fairly deep, and I made my way down holding onto branches and bushes along the way. Once at the bottom, I dreaded looking inside the car, for I was pretty sure I'd see the fellow from the night before. But there was nobody, much to my relief. But I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. The car looked like it had been pushed sideways over the edge. No easy task. I got on my radio and asked Ed what I was seeing. And he said, he and Jim both thought it was odd. I then told him I was going to hook up so they could pull the car out as there was nobody inside. It was a pretty standard recovery, and I watched them winch the car from above as I stood below, waiting for the coast to be clear before I climbed back up. And while I stood there watching the car slowly being pulled up the slope, I got a very strong feeling that something was watching me. It was so ominous that I turned around and scanned everything behind me, trying to overcome the urge to flee, feeling that my life was in danger. I didn't see a thing, but I can tell you I was up that slope in half the time it took me to come down, which is the opposite of what you'd expect. Sheriff Jim searched the car and found nothing unusual, just the guy's sleeping bag and normal personal stuff like clothes and such. He took the guy's registration papers from the glove box. He would use these to figure out who he was and contact his family. So far, he was considered a missing person, though for all we knew, he'd walked down into town and was having himself a big breakfast at the diner. The registration said his name was Miles. Well, we towed the car on in, and that was that. We were all soon on to other things, I had a recovery where someone had slid off into the burrow pit just the normal busy kind of day, 
and it wasn't until that evening that I was able to get home and see how Maggie and the dogs were all doing. Ed called and hadn't heard a word from the dog's owner, Miles, though he said Sheriff Jim had managed to track down the guy's daughter, though she hadn't heard anything from her dad. They all lived in some little town in Minnesota. The hounds seemed happy enough, but it was another sleepless night for me. I just couldn't understand how the car had been pushed sideways off the edge, and I kept flashing back to that ominous feeling. What if the guy had been the victim of some kind of foul play? Foul play by creatures I didn't even believe in. Maggie finally got tired of my tossing and turning and went to sleep in the spare bedroom. Now, what I'm about to relate here should be taken in the context that I'm not a bit superstitious. I don't even believe in ghosts, so you can bet I was shocked as anyone could be over all of this. It started with the two hounds and Boggs trying to get into bed with me. Now, like I said, Boggs usually sleep on top of the covers at my feet, but he was actually trying to get under the covers, which he'd never once in his life tried to do. He had that long cocker spaniel coat and slept pretty warm, no need for covers, the hounds were doing the same, so I wondered if the fire hadn't gone out. I got up to check, but no, it was fine. I put a few more logs on, and as I was sitting there, kind of poking at it, I thought I heard something outside. Now, all of a sudden, I had that ominous feeling again, like I was being watched by someone or something that meant me harm. And, Given that the dogs were also hiding, I knew that it wasn't my imagination. I went to my gun cabinet and unlocked it, taking out my shotgun and loading it. I had no idea what was going on, but I wasn't going to just sit around unprepared. Just like that, the feeling lifted, and I knew something had been watching me. Something that maybe understood what a gun was for. Maggie is much more security-minded than I am, and she always makes sure the curtains are pulled at night. But as I walked around, I could see where they'd been pulled back at the big living room picture windows, enough that someone could easily see inside. I wondered if one of the hounds hadn't done it, trying to see outside, and I closed it back up. I was too afraid to go outside until dawn, but when I did, I was dumbfounded to find tracks, giant tracks, about the same size as those up in the snow. I took photos and went back inside, now very much on edge. I wasn't sure whether I should show the tracks to Maggie or not, but decided I'd better so she would be on guard. Her reaction wasn't good at all, is all I can say, as I told her all about the tracks up on the road. She decided they'd somehow followed me home, which wouldn't be all that hard to do given the conditions of the road and how slow I was going. Maggie was the first to actually use the term Bigfoot, but I suspected all along that's what was going on. My skepticism was losing out to the facts is all I can say, but I still didn't want to believe this was what it was. I told her we'd been pranked, but I knew better given the dog and the strange feeling of being watched. I just didn't want to admit things like this could exist. She made breakfast while I tried to persuade the dogs to go outside, which they were reluctant to do. I was now wondering if we were going to end up with the hounds, as I knew Maggie would never take them to the shelter, providing the guy never showed up to claim the hounds. She'd actually named them, and I felt this was a bad portent, as we didn't need more dogs, especially hounds, as they're hard to keep from running. Boggs always stayed with us when we took him out for walks, but the hounds were the least of my problems right then. I just couldn't get out of my head that I needed to go back up again and look for the guy. I barely even knew his name for crying out loud, and he'd said he didn't want to ride, so why should I worry? I don't know the answer to that, except to say I wouldn't want people giving up on me easily if I were lost, assuming he was. Maggie refused to let me go back up there alone, and Ed and Jim were both busy, so she finally agreed to come along. We take our Jeep and lots of warm clothes and survival gear and leaving the dogs at home. 
I also took my radio so I could call Ed if needed, and I was sure to pack my shotgun and plenty of ammo. What I didn't know at the time was that taking Maggie along would save my life, or at least that's how it seemed. It didn't take us long to get up there, as the roads had pretty much melted off and were muddy, but not too bad. Once there, I showed Maggie what was left of the tracks, though they'd melted down a bunch and were hard to make out. She didn't say a word. She didn't need to, as the look on her face said it all. Well, there we were, and I had no idea what to do next. There was no way we could climb those cliffs to go on a search, nor did we want to do something so foolhardy. I decided to take one last look around to set my mind at ease, and we did just that. Walked around and looked. We found nothing unusual, but we did hear something. Far in the distance, from way above in the wild of the Bitterroot came a sound that chilled us both to the very bone. And even though it was broad daylight, we had that sense of foreboding. One gets when out in the dark, alone and vulnerable. We stood there for a moment, listening to the strangest call ever. A sound that came from massive lungs and went on and on like a siren, until it disintegrated into a low bellow like a bull. We weren't prepared for anything like that, but when the call was answered from somewhere nearby, we were suddenly terrified. The sound was so loud, it felt like it was vibrating through every molecule in our bodies, and after we got over the initial shock, we both jumped in the jeep. Whatever it was, it was close, and had undoubtedly been watching us, even though I hadn't felt any sense of foreboding. All I knew was that we needed to get out of there, except the jeep wouldn't start. I tried and tried to start it, but the battery seemed deader than a doorknob. I know batteries on their last leg will start just fine until they won't, giving up the ghost with no warning. But this battery wasn't that old. It actually seemed more like an electrical problem, like the starter wasn't getting any electrical current, just like Miles' car had acted, I realized. Maggie had reached over and locked my door, and when I looked up, I could understand why. I think she was too shocked to say anything, and I admire her for even having the sensibility to lock the door, though I didn't think it was going to make much of a difference when I saw what she was looking at. It seemed that three large men had come up from the creek below us at the same place where Miles' car had landed, but as they came closer and emerged from the bushes, I could see they weren't human not even close. At that point, time seemed to become warped or something. I can't even begin to describe it, but it was kind of like being underwater. Maggie and I discussed it later, and she felt the same sensation. Everything seemed to happen in slow motion, as if there was something in the atmosphere slowing these creatures down, like I said, as if they were underwater. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever experienced. They came over to the jeep, and I knew then and there what they were intending to do. They were going to push us over the side of the embankment, just like they'd done the car. These creatures had to be incredibly strong. Up to then, they hadn't even looked inside, but as they were starting to push our jeep sideways over the edge of the road, one of them stuck its face up to the window on Maggie's side. I'll never forget it. It was intelligent, but incredibly menacing, with big, black, deep-set eyes and dark skin stretched taut across its face that was almost human. And this is why I think Maggie being there saved my life, for it stopped pushing. We could hear it making sounds to its friends that were like some kind of language, and they stopped pushing too, and with that, they left. Why else would they have changed their minds? if not for seeing Maggie. I don't understand it, but maybe they didn't want to harm a woman. Maggie has a very kind face, and maybe they recognized how sweet she was. Who knows? And it was then that the jeep started right up. I'll never figure that one out. 
though I have since read that others have had similar things happened with encounters. Have you noticed how I keep avoiding the word Bigfoot and use words like creature instead? After all these years, I still haven't come to grips with this. I drove on back down the road, and it wasn't but a half a mile before we saw someone who was kind of trying to half hide in the bushes along the road while still walking along. I stopped when I realized it was Miles, the fellow who owned the hounds. He seemed surprised to see me, but quickly got in. Maggie flipping into the back. She later told me she wanted to be behind him, not in front of him, as he looked half nuts. He asked about his dogs, and I told him they were fine, and he could have them back any time. He thanked us, but soon devolved into an incoherent mess, muttering and even crying. I think as soon as he knew his dogs were okay, he just let it all hang out and kind of lost it. In all honesty, he was kind of worrying me, as he'd seemed like he'd totally gone over the edge, no pun intended. I guessed he'd been in the car when it was pushed off the road, for he had some pretty good scratches on his face, though he didn't seem to have any serious injuries. Maggie always has a level head, no matter what the situation, and she told me later she very quietly called the sheriff and asked him to have a deputy meet us at the bottom of the road, which they did. In fact, there were two deputies and they took Miles to the hospital. I felt I should have gone to a hospital too, a mental hospital. I've never felt so disoriented in my life. And after the adrenaline wore off, I went into what must have been a state of shock. I sat in my chair in the living room for hours, just staring at the wall. Maggie seemed to take it better, though she went through the same sleepless night afterward. Me, I was so exhausted from not being able to sleep that I later didn't have that problem. We had the hounds for a couple more days. Then Sheriff Jim called to tell me Miles' daughter had arrived and would be coming to get them, as Miles was just now getting out of the hospital. She showed up shortly thereafter and seemed like a really nice, caring person, maybe in her early 30s. The hounds seemed really happy to see her, so we handed them off without any worries. We asked her how her dad was doing, and she said she and her husband had come to take him home. They'd only been around him a few hours, but he seemed a little off to her, not as lively or something, but she felt he would gradually get better once he got back home. She added that he seemed to have complete amnesia concerning what had happened, not even recalling going up there in the first place. She was worried about that, and probably rightly so, though maybe it would be best not to remember, for who knows what actually happened. Maggie and I had our own problems to deal with from that experience, mostly in the form of nightmares, but as time went on, we both seemed to recover. I had a couple of more tow trips in that area, though on different roads, but nothing like that, just straightforward, get them out of the ditch kind of things. And like I said, I never went alone. Not long after that, we decided to sell the house and leave. It wasn't long until we were on our way out to Southern California where his sister lived. Several months later, I got a letter from Miles, forwarded from Ed. I was really surprised, but in it, he thanked me for taking care of his dogs and saying that if I hadn't taken them, he probably would have died. He said, he'd gradually started to recall what had happened, and basically, he'd been in the car when it was pushed over the edge, but had miraculously been uninjured. He'd seen what had pushed it over and suspected the strange creatures would come back, so he managed to sneak away, had hidden in a nearby small cave for the rest of the night. Because he was somewhat underground, it was warmer and kept him from freezing. Sure enough, he'd heard them looking for him, and they'd actually even come to the cave's entrance but apparently hadn't seen him. He'd waited for daylight and was getting ready to try to make a break when they came back. He felt like they would have come in, except they were too big. He said he lay there in terror in that cave all day through the next night, then gradually got up courage as he knew he would eventually die if he didn't get out. He made his way back to the road the following day. By then, he was dehydrated and hungry and was losing contact with reality such that it was. Finally, he said he knew people would wonder why he'd been out there in the first place and had refused to go back with us. 
he said he'd come upon hard times having just lost his job as an airline agent. And since someone told him there were jobs in Montana, he decided to leave Minnesota. He didn't have enough money for a motel, so had driven out into the boonies to spend the night. But once out there, his hounds had heard something and started bang, which terrified him. He tried to drive out, but his car wouldn't start, and so he called for help. Once I'd actually arrived and couldn't start his car, he said he'd kind of panicked, knowing he didn't have the money for a motel or car repair and decided to camp there. Glad I took his dogs. He said not going out with me was a decision he deeply regretted as it changed his entire life and he now had difficulty being alone. He was living with his daughter and had finally gotten a good job, but the entire event had taken its toll. I found a $100 bill in the envelope. I was glad to hear from him and I gave the money to Maggie who donated it to the local animal shelter. I actually wanted nothing to do with it as I knew that whatever we might buy would always make me think of him, which would in turn make me think of something I just as soon forget. And there wasn't enough money on earth to make me want to remember what I saw out there. In fact, I'd give almost everything I own to be able to forget it. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!